would, take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Acts. The book of Acts, if you have your hand out there, I've got two references on that number seven we're looking at. <clears throat> this morning we preached on Jesus is coming. And so tonight we're going to preach on Jesus returns. Boy, that's going to be a great day when Jesus returns. And I'm looking forward to it. I trust you are. I trust you're preparing. I trust that you are trying uh, to uh, serve the Lord and working toward pleasing Him. Because honestly, truthfully, the only life is the Christian life. It really is. <clears throat> I've lived on both sides of the fence, and some of you know have probably two. And there's no other life like the Christian life. And let's live for Him. And I want to try to challenge you tonight to see from the Scripture that He's coming again. This morning we saw the promise of God. So tonight we're going to look at the program of God. In recent days, we went to a wedding. When we walked into that wedding, they gave us a big, nice, beautiful program. And that identified everything. We could look down and see what was going to happen next and who's going to say what next. And here's the bride, here's the groom. We saw the program of that wedding. Can I tell you, according to the Word of God, there's a program of God. And He is going right along His schedule, whether you're in or whether you're out. He's going to go right along. And uh, so I trust tonight we'll see it. Acts chapter number 1, and we're going to go to Revelation chapter 19. But Acts chapter 1 and verse number 1. <clears throat> the former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to both do and teach until the day in which He was taken up, after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, <clears throat> to show also to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible truths, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they were therefore come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, what will thou at this time again, excuse me, at this time restore unto again the kingdom of, to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you should be witnesses both unto me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the othermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while he beheld, they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Verse 10. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, beholding two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, You men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus, notice that, which is taken up from you into heaven shall come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. The Bible is very, very clear in verse number 11 that the same Jesus that left is the same Jesus that's coming again. It's the same person. It's not an angel. It's not a different person. It's the same person. Now go with me to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. <clears throat> I want to try to uh, ignite something, hopefully in your mind and heart, just this week uh, after Sunday night, we uh, preached a little bit about this, and so I had folks come and say, man, I want to study the Revelation, I want to look at the last things, and I, we got some, it got some interest, and I'm so thankful for that. So in Le Revelation chapter 19, look with me in verse number 11. <clears throat> And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he stood judge and make war. His eyes were a flame of fire, and his head were as many crowns. He had written a, a name written that no man knew but he himself. He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name was called the Word of God. I love that expression. Verse 14, And the armies which were with were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen and white and clean. And out of his mouth go a sharp sword that with smote 
should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of the Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. You can go on to read, but we'll find in verse 17 that starts the battle of Armageddon. We'll look at it here in just a minute. But go back with me to Acts chapter 19. I want us to see that God has a program. And I'm going to do an overview quickly here. But we're going to look at the return. We're going to look at the return of Christ. He's coming again. We made a promise. We read that this morning. We studied that this morning that Jesus is coming again. There's a promise. There's a person. And there is a uh, preparation on our part, but there's a program God has. And you look around, you can see it's very evident. Uh, there's signs, there's seasons, there's, there's uh, uh, scenarios in our world. Everything around our world goes right back to the one event of Jesus is coming again. Everything. You can look at the world. It's on the very threshold. It's, on, it's at the very door. I mean, he's at the door. It's so much, so close. But yet we're living in such a Laodicean church age that, uh, you know, it's no big deal. You know, if he comes, so what? If he doesn't come, so what? And we read that in Second Peter this morning. There's scoffers. There's people that don't really believe it, doesn't really believe uh, that he's coming again because of the length of time. And we fail to realize that God's not dealing with our time. We, we deal with his time. We, he don't deal with our time. He don't step into time. He's in eternity. And we, we're in time. He's not. And so we get this mindset, well, if God didn't show up this date, well, apparently he's not coming. Well, if God doesn't do it on my time frame, then he's not coming. But we all know that God doesn't work on our timetable. God doesn't work on your timetable. God does as he pleases on his own time. And we have to get in on that. We don't, we don't ask God to get on what we're doing. We get on what he's doing. And he blesses that. So let's look at his return as a twofold event. We see here that in, Revela in, uh, in uh, Acts, that he has died, he is buried, he is resurrected from the dead. He is in his uh, glorified body, and we just read it. They're with him, and he's about to ascend to heaven. And right before he ascends, he tells the church what to do, go into all the world and preach the gospel. I'm going away. But the Holy Spirit is coming down to dwell. That's what the day of Pentecost was all about. Acts chapter 1 is identifying. He said, when you leave this place, go and wait. Go to the upper room and wait. And the Bible tells us they waited 40 days. There was 40 days there. Then the Bible says they waited. And they waited for the Holy Spirit. And we understand that Peter got up on the day of Pentecost and he preached that great sermon of the return. He preached that great sermon of Christ, the redemptive work of Christ, the crucified of Christ. And he preached about Christ. And the Bible says that's the day that the Spirit of God fell upon those people. And from that moment, the Holy Spirit of God indwelt the believer. No longer uh, is the believer without the Holy Spirit. Now, you and I, from that day forward in the book of Acts, tells us that we are now indwelt by the Holy Spirit. I have inside of me the third person of the Godhead, which is the Spirit of God. If you're here, you know the Lord Jesus as your Savior. You have the third part of the Godhead dwelling in you. He's inside of you. That's what he's speaking about. Well, when he left that day, we all know he came the first time in Bethlehem's manger. We know that he came through a virgin's womb. That's one of the fundamental truths that we hold to. He's a virgin-born son of God. We're not going to argue that. You know, they said there are several things that the liberals said uh, on the Council of Churches. They said, if you can just get rid of the virgin birth, we can all agree. <clears throat> We're not going to do that because if you eliminate the virgin birth, you eliminate him being God. If you eliminate the virgin birth, if you eliminate uh, the fact that he did not have an earthly father, then you eliminate him being God. So we're not going to give that up. We're going to hold to that. We're going to fight for that. We're going to cling to that. We're not going to be uh, apologizing for that. He is the virgin-born Son of God, period. That's where we're going to stand. The Bible teaches that. It's very clear. Uh, no, nothing to argue with that as far as I'm concerned. But he came through a virgin's womb, but he grew to be a man, 33 and a half years. He bled and died on the cross. His plan was to ascend. He was not going to stay on earth forever. He couldn't. He said, I must go away. There's no way that the work of the church could go forward if I'm still here. So he said, I've got to go away. And to give you the earnest, to give you the, the identification that you're a Christian, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. That's why we have the Holy Spirit today. This is the earnest of our inheritance. So now that he's ascended, but he did say this. <clears throat> 
He said, I want you to know, we read it again, I'll read it to you. He said in verse number 10, <clears throat> excuse me, verse number 9, he said, and at he, when he had spoken these things, behold, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. So as they stood there walking and talking and looking, the Bible says he ascended right out of their sight. And two men, in white apparel, we, we believe to think those are angels. And the Bible says that they spoke to the group and they said, Why ye stand gazing? Why are you amazed about this? Why are you so perplexed about this? Why are you so uh, gazing up at this? He said, This same Jesus is coming again. This same Jesus that you're looking at going away is going to come again. So we're longing for that day. And we understand that if you take the line upon line and precept upon precept, Jesus Christ is coming again. Let's look at it. So go with me now to Revelation chapter 3. We're going to see his first event, the, the second coming of Christ is a twofold event. Let's look at the first phase of it. In Revelation chapter 3, I touched on a little bit last week and trust you may have gotten excited and got interested in it. And so let's look at it. Revelation chapter number 3, here's the rapture of the church. Now we read chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3 and we find he's speaking to churches. He's speaking to the church of Laodicea, speaking to the church of Smyrna, he's speaking to these churches. We get down to verse 22 of 3. He says, And he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. Now you get to verse number 1 of chapter 4. <clears throat> and he said, After this, John's writing these. He's pinning these words. He says, After this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard, as it were a trumpet talking with me, said, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee these things must be hereafter. Now here... There's no more of the church. From this very moment, when the trumpet sounds, the Bible says, we'll read in 1 Thessalonians here in just a minute, we'll find that Jesus Christ comes again. He doesn't touch the ground. He doesn't touch his feet on the ground, as we'll see here in a few minutes. It's a twofold event. The Bible says the trumpet's going to sound. The dead, let's just go over there. Go back with me to 1 Thessalonians. And I hope I don't want to bore you uh, with flipping back and forth, but we must understand line upon line, precept upon precept. We've got to combine these verses and sister verses so we can see what he's talking about. Notice with me in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. So when you compare Revelation 4.1 to 1 Thessalonians 4.13, here's what he says. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, Concerning them which were asleep, those are those that have died before us, that have trusted Jesus as their Savior, that ye sorrow not, even as others have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which also sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Here it is. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. Now Paul's not making this up. Uh, they're, they're, they're saying this is what God has said, which which we are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Here it is. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of the archangel, and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So those that are in the grave now, those that are dead in Christ, they will rise first. Verse 17. Then... We, that's us, it's if we're remaining here today, if, it, if, it, if the trumpet blew at 545 today, those dead in the ground that knew the Lord Jesus as their Savior would come up out of the grave. The Bible says, verse 17, then we, we'd sit here. And the Bible says we would be caught up. I love this. He said, when we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. Here it is, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. In verse 18 it says, comfort one another with these words. Now I don't know about you, but sometimes that brings a little fear in my mind. He's coming again. Are you ready? And I'm looking for him. Does that comfort me or does that convict me? Sometimes it convicts me when I read these things and I read these words and I read that Jesus Christ is coming again. These are promises. We read that this morning, the promises of God. He is coming again. You know, His return brings me strength. His return brings me awareness. His return brings me accountability. You know what the reason a lot of people don't want to join churches and don't want to get in church and get faithful to church and they don't really want to get involved is because they don't want the accountability. 
Don't, don't, don't get me accountability. Don't, Brother uh, uh, Ernie was talking this morning in Sunday school. He was talking about church discipline. Tremendous uh, Bible lesson about church order and church uh, ordinances. And he said one of the, the things that lacks the most, and I think he's right, is church discipline. You don't hardly hear church discipline anymore. Because people don't want to be disciplined. People don't want to be accountable. People don't want the, the, the discipline it takes to be what God wants us to be. So, But we need that. We need that discipline. We need that correction. We need that idea that Jesus is coming again. It causes us to live right. It causes us to be urgent. It causes us to, to walk up right. You know, if, if there's no consequence, we said this the other day, if there's no consequences, people won't live right. If there's no consequences, people won't do right. That's the reason our world is so mixed up and so crazy as the way it is. It's because there's no punishment. You start punishing this nonsense of our society, you start bringing some things into accountability, a lot of this stuff will go away. The same thing here. God said He's coming again, so we've got to be ready. If you go with me now uh, to, uh, let, me, let me go with me to verse number uh, 17. He says, I love this, then we. I, I put a big parenthesis about the word we. We which are alive. That, that's you and I. You know, that's a blessed hope. That's a blessed hope that I have that Jesus Christ is coming again. Ah, oh, when he left in the book of Acts, he left from the Mount of Olives. That's the location. You say, why is that so important? Because the Bible teaches us he's going to come back to the Mount of Olives. The very place he left, the very, the very place he left from is the place he's coming back to. He's going to set his feet on the Mount of Olives. See, but the world, is, world wants, to, wants God a little bit, but they don't want God wholeheartedly. They want God a small portion, but when it comes to the real seriousness of the Christian life and, and to get right with God and to live according to the Word of God and do what God said, I don't want it. I don't want it. As I said, God's going to come regardless. Jesus Christ is going to come regardless whether we're ready or not. You know, when I think about Jesus' coming to earth, 4,000 years of history was prior to, to Jesus' birth. About 4,000 years was, had played out before Jesus Christ came to earth through the virgin's womb. 4,000 years or so. It amazes me that for 4,000 years, God just trucked along through the, through the Old Testament. And when he gets to Jesus Christ, his birth changed everything. When Jesus came through the virgin's womb and he grew to be a man, it changed everything. It went from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Just his first appearance changed everything. I mean, could you imagine... What, what the Lord Jesus did from the Old Testament just to the transition of the New Testament. He changed everything. It was all laws. It was all ceremonials. It was all symbols. It was all these symbolic things. I was trying to explain a little, a little bit to this to Emily last night. And I was talking about the lamb. In the Old Testament days, the families would have to take a lamb 14 days, they'd have to put it in their home. They'd have to make sure it had no blemishes. They'd have to make sure it was a good lamb. It was perfect. His coat was perfect. Uh, they'd bring it into the house. They would make sure it's clean and no blemishes and absolutely perfect. You know, after 14 days, what they did to that thing? They cut his throat. And they would drain the blood and they'd sacrifice that lamb. And she looked at me with these big old eyes. And I said, I'm not trying to scare you. I said, it'd be like Fluffy. We got an old big old dog that ain't worth a nickel, but we love her. Old Fluffy, you know. And I said, it'd be like us bringing Fluffy in here and, 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 and cleaning her up and then cutting her throat and killing her. I hope I didn't scare her to death, but she was like, you know what I said that is? That's the innocent dying for the guilty. And that is a picture. Those Jewish children, don't you know, they never forgot when daddy brought that lamb in and slit his throat and poured that blood out and sacrificed that lamb. Don't you know, they loved that lamb. They, they cared for that lamb. They, they protected that lamb and they watched over that lamb and they knew this was, our, this was in our home. This was a, a pet, if you will. And they watched their daddy cut his throat and kill it and sacrifice that thing. And their daddy say, that's the innocent dying for the guilty. A picture of of the Lord Jesus Christ. But when he came on the scene, all that changed. I set off to say this, when he comes again, everything is going to change. 
When he comes the second time, everything's going to change. You know what's going to change? There's no going to be no more curse on the earth. I'm looking forward to him coming. I hope you're living such a way that you're looking forward to him coming. You know what, you know what it means for him to come again? There's no more sin. There's no more curse. Uh, there's no more, no more murders, no more abuse, no more crime, no more lying, no more stealing, uh, no more anything. He changes all that. No more sickness, no more pain, no more cancer, praise God. No more disease, and I like this one, no more tears. No more death, the Bible says. No more war, and I love this one the best. No more Satan, praise God. God's going to bind him hand and foot and cast him into the lake of fire. I, I'm looking forward to the day when there's no devil. I'm ready for him to return. I, I want him to come. I, 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 you know, you look, on the, you look on the news, you look around us, and you say, my goodness, even so come, Lord Jesus. He's going to change everything. Go with me before I go much further. Go with me to Revelation 21. Go back over with me to Revelation 21 real quick. I, I'm going to show you the no mores of Revelation 21. The no mores of Revelation 21. I love this. I, I read this last night when I was preparing the message. In Revelation 21, look in verse number 1. He says, no more sea. In verse number 4, no more tears, praise the Lord. Uh, no more death, praise the Lord. No sorrow, no crying, verse 4. No more pain. Oh, no more ibuprofen. No more pain. Look down with me, verse number uh, 8. But the fearful, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, liars. <laughs> There's no more. <laughs> it's gone. They're out of here. They're, they're not there. They're not in heaven. There's no more liars. There's no more unbelievers. There's no more abominable. There's no more murderers. I went out. We were talking about Wyoming earlier. And we went out there, and out there, then they locked their doors. Got up one morning, the door standing open. And I told Josh, I said, what? And made my, I just almost stood in the, the door standing wide open. I've been sleeping in the house all night. <laughs> door wide open. Didn't have a gun or nothing. He said, oh, yeah, we don't lock the door around here. Whew, not my house. You know what one man said about a door lock? He said, you know, that door lock was for your protection, not mine. I think that's pretty good. But you know what? There's not going to be a lock on that gate in city. The city of God, there's not going to be locks. There's not going to be padlocks. There's not going to be chains. There's not going to be gates as far as locking them. There's not going to be windows you got to keep shut. You don't have to have guard dogs. I was talking to Brother Justin the other day about, uh, he said they love dogs in Zambia. They love dogs because there's so much thievery. And he said, the Zambian people do not like dogs. And he said, German shepherds are the best. You can sell German shepherds in Zambia all day long because there's so much thievery that the Zambians don't like dogs. So if you've got a dog in the front yard, you're good. You know, you're protected. And I thought, there's no more guard. They don't need a guard dog in heaven. It's all protected. But let's look at it here. Let's look at the first one. I want to show you the rapture. <clears throat> we read it. First Thessalonians. Go back with me, if you will. We're going to dissect this just a little bit and show you the first phase of it, the rapture. Would you write that down somewhere, just the rapture of the church? Now, we understand the word rapture is not in the Bible, but the word Bible is not in the word Bible. In the Bible's word, the word Bible is not in the Bible. So it's a word used to catch away. It's just a symbolic word that we use, but it's just catching away. We read that. In 1 Thessalonians 4, he said they're going to call us away. That trumpet's going to sound. It's going to be called up, verse 17 in 1 Thessalonians 4. We're going to be caught up. You say, I don't like to fly. Well, you'll like to fly that day. You say, I'm scared of heights. You won't be that day. You say, that's, that's a little odd to believe, preacher. Honestly, when you think about God, when you think about all the things God is and God does, you can't understand who he is anyway. You can't comprehend what he is. I can't fathom them. I can't uh, understand a, a, my little finite mind, my little, my little brain that I have can't even understand nothing, absolute zero about God. But notice what he says in verse 13. He says, be not ignorant, brethren. Be not ignorant. You know, ignorant is not being stupid. Ignorant is just not knowing. 
A lot of the world simply is living their life in ignorance. They're just living their life with no regard for God and no regard for the Bible. And so truthfully, they don't really have any idea, spiritually speaking, that he is coming again. And that's what he said here. He says, brethren, don't be ignorant. And, and I hate to even say this, but a lot of church folks are ignorant about his coming. That's what he's speaking to. He's speaking about the brethren. Notice what he says. I would not have you ignorant brethren. He didn't say ignorant Lost people, he said, ignorant brethren. There's a lot of people that are all mixed up about the coming of the Lord. And he's coming regardless. I know there's amillennial, premillennial, postmillennial, but the truth is he's coming. He's coming regardless. And we find here that we got to be ready. We got to be on guard. We got to be looking. He says, because, notice this, concerning them which are asleep. Verse 14, for we, I said it a minute ago, who's he coming for? He's not coming for the lost. When the rapture takes place, he's not coming for the lost. He's coming for the saved. He's coming for the believer. He's coming for the Christian. His bride is not going to go through the tribulation. We're tri pre-tribulation people. I am not going to go through the tribulation. His bride is not going to go through the tribulation. There's a, there's a premillennial, I mean, there's a pre-tribulation, a mid-trib, and a post-trib. I feel sorry for the mids and the post. I feel sorry for those people. They, have, they think they're going to go through that. I'm going to tell you something. If you miss the rapture on this side, you're going to miss it. If you miss the gospel, you miss trusting Jesus Christ under the age of grace. If you don't trust Jesus Christ as your Savior when the trumpet blows, you're not going to get it. The Bible says he'll send a strong delusion in the book of Revelation that you'll believe a lie. You're not going to get it. And I'm not scaring you. I'm just trying to tell you the truth. God says he, the only ones that he's going to catch away, the only ones that are going to go in the rapture of the church is the believer. That's the only ones. Now, we understand through the tribulation that the Jews and he turns to the Jews and we're going to see it here in just a minute. But as far as the church, as far as the Gentile, as far as the gospel, as far as the grace of God goes, if you've heard a presentation of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, when you die or the trumpet sounds, you'll meet God and go to eternity when the Christless hell. The Bible says, notice this, that we be not ignorant. Be not ignorant, brethren. We, we, the Christians, Notice verse 17, he says it again. He says, then we which are alive. I love that. The rapture is for the believer. The rapture is for those that trust Jesus. You say, why is that so important? Because if you have fellows, uh, fellow friends, and you have uh, girls, if you had friends at school, and boys, if you have friends at school, and they don't know Jesus as your Savior, guess what? Guess what? It's a shocking truth, but they'll be left behind if you don't tell them. You say, why is it so urgent that we tell? Why is it so urgent we be a witness? Why is it so urgent that we live right and, and have the right testimony? And when we, when we tell someone about the gospel, they'll get saved. You know why? Because they're going to die and go to hell without him. I hate to think, and I'm so burned even thinking about it. It even burns my heart to even think that I know people that I should have witnessed to and that I should have gave the gospel to, and, but I walked around them. And one of these days, if they die and go to hell, some of it may be on my hands. Oh, think about the people that we should witness to. And it, it, oh, in my mind, I'm thinking now, I've heard, told you the story of uh, a brother. Uh, he's not a brother uh, as far as I know, but it's uh, Jim Alexander. And I still never forget Jim Alexander. I was burdened by him one day to go witness to him. And I sat on his couch and I went in and sat down. He was near death. And I went in and sat down, talked with him. We talk about everything under the sun. But I never dealt with him about his soul. We talked about baseball and football and weather and we talked about all those things and I left and grieved in my heart knowing I should have talked to him about his soul. I will never forget, Chad and I were just dating and I was at a fairground. We pulled up and a lady I worked with walked up to my truck door. I should never forget, we hadn't got out of the truck. She walked up, she said, did you hear him about Jim Alexander? I said, no. She said, he's in a coma. And boy, just like a dagger, God just stuck it in my heart. And I told her, so we got to go. So I went to the hospital immediately and his dear, little dear mother was in the room and I walked up, I said, Miss Dot, can I speak to him? She said, he's in a coma. And they tell me the last thing that goes is your hearing. I would to God, that's the truth. And I walked up beside his bed and I got down beside him. I said, Jim, if you can hear me, I said, I need to tell you about the Lord Jesus. And I need to tell you, he died for you. And I don't know. I don't know. I would to God. I would to God he had it. 
I would to God he heard it. I would to God he could believe it in his heart. But I have no idea knowing that. And forever I will ever remember disobeying God and not telling that dear man about his soul. You say, is that important? It's just that important. Be very sensitive about this because it's true because he tells us this rapture's coming. Look, it's going to happen. He says, it's not, notice this, verse 15. He says, remain in the coming of the Lord. I love this. Shall not prevent them which are asleep. You're not going to stop it. I, I was teaching in class the other day at Springdale and I was talking about cognitive thinking, the word cognitive thinking. And I was trying to get them to understand, quit procrastinating, quit putting it off, quit, quit, quit saying you'll do it another day. And I said, think about it this way. I said, you got homework to do, don't you? Yeah. More than likely, uh, you'll go to school tomorrow. Yeah. I said, cognitive thinking says, go ahead and do your homework because more than likely, you got to go to school tomorrow. Most of you are going to go to work tomorrow. That's cognitive thinking. I might as well get ready because I got to go to work tomorrow. It's cognitive thinking. Say, well, it's truth. It's, it's truth. It's, it's factual things. So let's just get it done. Look, this is a factual truth. It's factual that Jesus Christ is coming again. It's factual that he's going to come in a moment. It's factual that if those that, that, that do not trust Jesus as your Savior will die and go to hell. That's factual. We've got to get stirred up about it. He said, stir up your pure minds because he's coming again. Go with me to 1 Corinthians. If you'll take hold your Bible and go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Ah, oh, may God help us and help me as get off my lazy self and be a witness and be a, be a gospel presentation to people that know, that do not know the Lord Jesus as their Savior. May God help us. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 51. Ah, oh, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. There is coming a time there will be a generation of people that will be living when he comes. He said, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the, dead, for the trump shall sound, and the dead, in, dead shall be raised incorruptible, we shall be changed. For this corruption must put on incorruption, for this mortal must put on immortality. Verse 54, verse 55, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. I love this. But thanks be to God, which give us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's time, beloved, it's time to be a witness. His rapture is coming. And then notice the next one. I want to go back to the book of Revelation. Stop off with me at Revelation chapter 4. And if you have your Bibles with you, I'd like you to do something for me. Revelation chapter 4. I'd like you to take your finger and hold chapter 4, just like this. And go with me to chapter... Now hold it in. Hold one finger in chapter 4. And go with me to chapter 19. And do it just like this, if you don't mind. Hold it just like that. From Revelation 4 to Revelation chapter 19, this is a description, those chapters from chapter 4 through chapter 18 is a description of the tribulation time. When the rapture takes place, see a lot of people say, when's the world going to end? When the rapture takes place, the world's not over yet. There's at least, we know at least seven years after the rapture. We know for a fact, according to the Word of God, that there's seven years of tribulation. Let's just imagine from right now, if the rapture took hold today, if we left out of here at 6 o'clock, you got three more minutes. If the, if the rapture took place in three minutes, they'd be seven more years of history we got to go through. Seven more at least. That's called the tribulation. When the, when the Gentile, we are the church, when it's, when it's uh, completed... We're gone up. We're called out of here. God is going to turn back to the Jew. That's the tribulation from Revelation chapter 4 all through chapter 18. He's dealing with the nation of Israel. He's turning back. That's the book of Daniel teaches, the 70th week, Jacob's trouble. That's when God has concluded the church. That's when God has sealed up the church and called it up. That's the bride, and he turns back to Israel. 
If you remember that Israel turned their back on God, so God turned his back on them and went toward the church. That's the Gentiles. That's us. We're grafted in, the Bible says. So we're, we, we come a Jewish nation by adoption, the Bible calls it. So when he turns back, to the Jewish nation, we're gone. You can read it here in Revelation chapter 19. You find that this is the marriage supper of the Lamb. So chapter 19, verse number 1, down through verse number 7, you and I, while the tribulation is going on on earth, you know where you and I are? We're sitting at the marriage supper of the Lamb. I'm having a feast. With all the saints of past, we're all sitting at the, at the marriage supper of the Lamb. You can read it, chapter 1, chapter 19, verse 1, all the way down to verse number 7. So we're, we're fellowshipping with God. We're in the presence of Jehovah. We're in the presence of the Almighty God and with all the saints. And we're having a meal. We're coming down, the Master calleth. Coming down, that's what the ver verse says. So we're with the Lord Jesus. But after that, then here's the revelation after he gets his saints all rallied together at the marriage supper, we have, a, we have a meeting that day. Notice what he says, verse number 7 of Revelation chapter 19. He's dealt with the nation of Israel. He's dealt through the tribulation period. Verse number 7 of Revelation 19. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his wife, that's us, that's the bride, had made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, Clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he saith to me, Right blessed are they which are called of the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are true sayings of God. And I fell down at his feet to worship. And he said unto me, See thou, do it not. For I am fellow servant of thy brethren, and have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy. Verse 11, we pick it up. And that's when... God, the Lord Jesus, and all of us are going to come and we're going to battle the devil. You can read it, Revelation chapter 19. This is the revelation. This is the now is when Jesus Christ is coming back to earth and he's going to do away with the evil and satanics and demonics and all the devils of hell. He's going to fight. We're going to win. We're going to destroy them. Verse number, chapter number 19, verse number 11. <clears throat> Look with me down to verse 17. And the angel standing in the sun, he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls of the, that fly in the midst of heaven, Come, gather yourselves unto the supper of the great God. You know what God did? God has just unleashed the army. It's called the Battle of Armageddon. Right on down. I mean, there's death and destruction. Notice this all the way down to verse 20, verse 21. And the remnant was slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which, which sword proceedeth out of the mouth of his mouth, and the fowls were filled with their flesh. And I'm telling you what, this is a nothing but an out and out war. I love this. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having a key of bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold on the dragon, the old serpent, praise God, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. So we're in a war, and, and we in Christ come down, and he binds, and that's Jesus doing that, by the way. He binds Satan, and he binds him and puts him in a prison for a thousand years, and that's a thousand-year millennial reign. Notice what he does and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till a thousand years should be fulfilled. And after this, he must be loosed for a little season. For a thousand years, Christ, we reign with Christ on the splendor of earth. We reign, and we run, and we reign, and he sits on the throne of David. And you say, why is it so important? Because he promised thousands of years ago that he sat on the throne of David. He's fulfilling that promise. God, even in the tribulation, even in after the tribulation, He is fulfilling the promises He told Abraham thousands of years ago. You say, why is that important? Because God keeps His promise. Amen. Just like He said He'd come again. He's promising. He told David, I, I, your, your uh, uh, throne will be forever. Abraham, I'll bless the nations that bless you. I'll curse the nations that curse you. He's still fulfilling His promises to Abraham and to David all those years later right here when he sits on his own throne. For a thousand years, he sits on his throne. Go with me now, verse number seven. And when the thousand years were expired, Satan shall be loosed 
out of his prison. Now, for, for God's own purposes, he allows Satan to be loose. He, he's in prison. He's in, he's in a bound position. He cannot deceive the nations for a thousand years. And God, of his own permission, lets him out for a little season. And here's what he does. Immediately, he should go out to deceive the nations which are the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle and a number of them, which is the sand of the sea. And on and on it goes, verse number 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever. Now, here's a, here's a penetrating thought, verse number 11. Here's what John saw. And he saw a great white throne and him that sat on it. Can I tell you, right here, right here is a sight that's unimaginable. At the great white throne, you and I are going to be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. We're not going to be judged for our sins because our sins were on Calvary's cross. We were judged for our sins on Calvary's cross. But for those that rejected the Lord Jesus, those that went through life without Christ, and those that God haters and rejected the, the grace of God, here's where they'll be appearing. One, one man preached a message one time, said, Everybody gets to go to heaven, but not everybody gets to stay. I thought, wow. God's going to drag those that rejected him out of hell. You know, hell is nothing but a holding cell, hell is nothing but a prison. Until this day right here, when he drags him out of hell, you can read it, verse number 12. He said, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. God said he's going to drag all those God-haters and all those God-rejectors and all those grace-rejectors, he's going to bring them out of hell, and he's going to stand them before God, and they're going to confess that he is the Son of God, he is the Lamb of God, God. He is the Messiah. They're going to confess with their mouth. They're going to bow their knees. They're going to confess that He is God to the glory of the Father. That's what the Bible says. And on that day, after they pronounce publicly that He is God, here's what happens. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. Death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. Here it is. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. See, we think hell's bad. We, we, people joke about hell. People call it a cuss word and they use the word hell. I'm going to tell you something. Hell is, is nothing compared to the lake of fire. That's eternity. I don't know about you, but this sort of shakes me to my core that one of these days all this is going to take place. Notice this one. This, this always penetrates me. Verse 15 of Revelation 20. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast, was, was cast into the lake of fire. There, there's a song that goes out that a guy comes to eternity, he comes to the judgment, and they're looking in the book, and he's flipping, and he's sort of frantically flipping, like he can't find his name. And he's standing there saying, Look again. Look again. And he looks and he said, it's got to be in there. It's got to be in there. He said, look again. Look again. and Look again. And he looks and he says, sorry, I can't find your name. Oh, he's coming again, friend. He's coming again. And the Bible says, if your name is not written in the Lamb's book of life, he said, you're going to be cast into the lake of fire forever, forever, and forever. And then, chapter 21, it's all over. All the wickedness is over. Chapter 20, it's all over. God has dissolved... God has cleaned his hands. God has purged this world. There's no more sin. You read chapter 21. I love this. Everything's new. Notice verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and they were no more seas. And on and on it goes. He's coming again. 
He's going to come. We're going to see him in the clouds. We're going to leave here. And then he's coming again. He's going to reveal himself. And when he comes, he's going to bring the wrath of the Almighty God. The Bible says they're going to, they're going to seek death and they cannot find it. I'm going to tell you something. Tribulation, we're in tribulation now. You've lost your mind. Half the stuff you read from chapter 4, uh, three quarters of the stuff you read from chapter 4 to chapter 18 has not happened yet. That's all prophecy. And I believe future prophecy because I've seen the proof of the past prophecy. This book is true. This book is real. It's going to come to pass just like God's program says it is. It's not going to miss a beat. It's not going to miss one iota. Everything's going to happen exactly like God says it is. And I trust tonight, if you're not ready, if you're not ready to meet him, get ready. Let's pray together. Father, we love you.